Well, good morning. Happy Easter. Yeah. Um, you guys, on this Easter, what we're really trying to wrestle with is this, is the fact that how do we get uh, from tragedy or from the mess of our lives to his masterpiece? How do we get there? What's that look like? Maybe we could put it this way. How do we get from tragedy to the beautiful? How do we go, really, from the, the incredible tragedy of, th- of Friday, Friday uh, in a cross that's full of torture and pain and death and hurt, and how do we get to this strange place where now we decorate the cross with flowers? Seems a little odd, doesn't it, in a way? Because how could we go from that symbol of such pain to this expression of such beauty? How do we do that? Because Friday was full of so much tragedy and so much pain. In fact, it's all about tragedy. It's this. The religious leadership of Jesus' day found that Jesus to be dangerous. And then the political leadership of his day found that Jesus to be expendable, right? We'll take Barabbas rather than him. That's fine. He's expendable. Or the public opinion turned dramatically against Jesus as that week went on. And they all called for him to be crucified. How do we go from a place where Jesus is betrayed by one of his closest friends, Judas, for 30 pieces of silver, gives him up. And Jesus is then deserted by the 11. They all leave. And he goes from a place where Jesus endures the mockery of seven bogus trials. In the midst of that, it's an incredible tragedy. How do we go from a place where Jesus is beaten and he's whipped within an inch of his life? We can't even describe how really grotesque what he went through was really all about. It's amazing. And then Jesus is shamefully hung on a cross naked for the world to see. Jesus endures then on that that cross, this incredible place of tragedy. He endures God's wrath put on his shoulders for you and for me. Then Jesus experiences for the very first time isolation and alienation from God the Father because of the wrath he had taken. Wow. Jesus is buried in a borrowed tomb like a common pauper. He's just stuck in there, wrapped up and left to lie. Jesus' tomb is sealed with and guarded by the Roman authority. And then Jesus' followers and his family are clearly without any hope. It's an incredible tragedy. The city of Jerusalem is in disarray and everything's a disaster. Everything fell apart. It's a mess, right? Of course it is. And you know what? I don't know about you, but our lives can feel like that too. (coughs) Our lives can feel like a tragedy because there's all sorts of disappointments that we go through in life, aren't there? You can name them today. You feel them today. There are all sorts of defeats that we go through where we're really defeated. We lose, either at the hand of someone else or sometimes by our own hand, that there is defeat. There's disillusionment. You wonder, really, is it worth it? What's going to happen? What do we do? There's such disillusionment. And then there's what I call delinquencies. We're just downright delinquents sometimes. We just do what we ought not to do. We're delinquent in life. And we face all these things in life, and we come up to this thing that our lives can be a mess too, right? Of course they can be. We make all sorts of mistakes. And then comes this thing, the dawning of the third day. And then something incredibly beautiful happens. Amazingly beautiful. The tomb is empty and death is defeated. That Jesus is risen from the dead. So let me ask the question again. How do we get from tragedy to beautiful? How do we get there? I have one word for you this morning. And it's this word, that we've been ransomed. We've been ransomed. See, a ransom is when you belong to something or someone and you get stolen and someone pays a ransom to get you back. And here's the deal. Jesus died on the cross as a ransom for you. He paid the price, right? So in fact, I want to look at a passage this morning. It happens a little bit before this core part of the Easter story, but I think Jesus tells us what it's really going to be all about. Look at this in Mark chapter 10, verses 32 to 35. And it says this, and they were on the road going up to Jerusalem. Now, just so you know, Jesus is traveling with his his, uh, disciples and a larger group of people who are following him. To get to Jerusalem, he has to go through Jericho. Uh, On his way to Jerusalem, on his way to Passover, 
along with thousands and thousands of others who are headed for Jerusalem for Passover. And this is somewhere before Jerusalem because in, verse, in chapter 19, it's going to say when he gets to Jericho. I'm sorry, it's before he gets to Jericho because he's going to get there in a minute. But it says that while they're on the road going up to Jerusalem, and Jesus was walking ahead of them, and they were amazed, and those who followed were afraid. So somehow, the disciples were amazed at what was going on. They somehow found this to be kind of exciting, kind of interesting. They were amazed at all of it. But the others who were following, it says, were profoundly afraid. Now, it doesn't tell us exactly why they were afraid. But you've got to get the sense that there's kind of a, a buzz beginning to happen about Jesus. In fact, it's already been determined in Jerusalem that they wanted to kill him. And that probably began to get out. <laughs> Jesus is a bit of a dividing figure in, in this part of the story. And there are a lot that are following him that thought, wow, we're going to Jerusalem and something incredible is going to happen. And others were saying, we're going to Jerusalem, but I'm afraid of what's going to happen here. And they were concerned. Well, let's go on in verse 32. And taking the 12 again, he began to tell them. There are times where Jesus was always obviously with a large group of people sometimes much larger than this that would be following him, but he would take his 12 aside and he would teach them uniquely. And here it says that he took them aside and he began to tell them what was going to happen to him. He began to prepare them, anticipate, forecast what was coming down the road. Look at this. He says in verse 33, see, he says, see, we are going up to Jerusalem and the Son of Man, referring to himself, will be delivered over to the chief priests and the scribes. And they will condemn him to death <coughs> and deliver him over to the Gentiles. This should have been a very humbling, scary thing for them. But they seem to be amazed. And look at this in verse 34. And they took, and they will mock him and spit on him and flog him and kill him. And then he makes this amazing short statement. And after three days, he will rise. Now, if you were to hear those words, they're going to take me and turn me over to the Gentiles and they will beat me and flog me and spit on me and they will kill me and then I'll rise in three days. You would, you would have to be a bit, not only confused, <clears throat> but you would have to be subdued, wouldn't you? But look at what happens in verse 35. James and John seem to have heard only the last part. They seem only to have kind of understood the glory is coming and they are like, okay, so James and John, the sons of Zebedee, came up to him and they said, hey, Jesus, can we talk for a second? Hey, teacher, um, we, wanna, we want you to do whatever we ask of you. It seems a bit odd, doesn't it? You're like, really? You arrogant son of a gun. I mean, what in the world are you doing? Hey, Jesus, hey, you're going you're gonna to somehow rise from the dead. There's going to be glory. So, hey, tell you what, we'd like you to do whatever we want you to do, okay? Now, I don't know if I, uh, what you would do, but if I were Jesus, I would have said, Hey, like, sit down and shut up, you know? Uh, what, like, who do you think you are kind of thing? Well, here, Jesus very kindly in verse 36, he says to them, so what do you want me to do for you? So he's going to draw them out. He's going to find their heart, right? He's going to see what's going on here. And so he says, well, what do you want me to do? And they said to him, well, here's what we want you to do. We want you to grant us to sit. Now, these are brothers, right? Okay, so they want to kind of be together. They're bros, they're together. And they say, hey, Grant to us to sit, one at your right hand and one at your left, in your glory. That's all we want. Hey, you know, and they've probably separated themselves from the other ten, right, a little bit, because you don't want to necessarily say that in front of everybody else. You'd say it, hey, Jesus, here's the deal. Hey, in your glory, could, could he sit at your right hand and could I sit at your left? Could we be really close? And you think, I, then I really want to just kick him out. I mean, I want to put him on, you know, out of school suspension at this point. Like, get out of here. But, uh, but here's what Jesus says to them. You do not know what you are asking. You don't really get it, guys. You totally are missing the deal. Are you able to drink the cup that I drink? Remember back on Good Friday, Jesus says to Peter, when Peter cuts off Malchus's ear, he says, hey, look, are you asking me not to drink the cup that the Lord gave me to drink, that God the Father gave me to drink? the cup of his wrath? Are you asking me not to do that? And here he says, hey, are you guys, are you willing, or are you able to drink the cup that I'm going to drink? Or to be baptized with the baptism with which I'm baptized, meaning 
a baptism into death. Are you willing to do that, guys? I don't think you know what you're asking, James and John. I don't think you know what you're doing here. And then they said to him, well, yeah, yeah, we can do that. Yeah, we got it, man. We got it covered. We're able to do that. They totally are missing it, right? Now look at this. And Jesus said to them, the cup that I drink, you guys, you will drink. You are going to drink the drink of suffering. I, I'm not gonna, I can't prevent you from that. That's part of following me, that there will be a, a piece of suffering in this. And he says, and the, the baptism, you'll be baptized with that. The bapti- my baptism, yes, you'll go through that. But then it goes on. But in verse 4, he says, but to sit at my right hand and at my left is not mine to grant, but it is for those to whom it has been prepared. That is God's business. That is not mine to give away. That is, God, that is God the Father's position. Yes, you'll go through suffering, but this is not mine to grant. This is God. To do whoever he prepares in whatever way he's going to prepare. And then in verse 41, and when the ten heard it, okay, they weren't too far away. When the ten heard it, they began to be indignant at James and John. You can't really blame them, can you? You're like, really, guys? You know, and so there starts to be a conflict between them. And so Jesus decides to stop the conflict And he says, Jesus called them to him and he said to them, you know that those who are considered rulers, and he's going to talk about leadership here for a second, but he's going to talk not just about leadership in an earthly kind of way, he's going to talk about real leadership. And he's going to talk about him as the leader, about the profoundness of him as the son of God. He's going to say this, you know that those who are considered rulers over the Gentiles lord it over them. And their great ones love to exercise authority over them. That's what earthly leadership looks like. They love to control other people. They love to be the center of attention. That's what earthly leadership is all about. But look in verse 43. But it says, but it shall not be so among you. This incredible, important teaching about the heart and the nature of being a leader but also just being a follower of Jesus and what that's all about. And he says, it shall not be that way among you, but whoever would be great among you (coughs) shall be your servant. And whoever would be first among you must be slave of all. Wow. Look at verse 45. For even the Son of Man came not to be served, but to serve. And then look at this last line. And to give his life as a ransom for the many. That he was going to give his life in exchange to buy something back. And what he's going to buy back with his life and with his blood is going to be you. And it's going to be me that he wants to buy back. He offers as a ransom in exchange for us. It's pretty amazing, isn't it? So, so what do we do with that? What do we do? What, therefore, what now? It, it seems to me this, that what sounded like a tragedy when Jesus says, it is finished. So on that particular cross, he said a few really important things at the end of his life here. He said, it is finished, as if he was giving up, it was done the fight is over, we lost. We wanted to take over, we wanted to defeat that which was wrong, and we hung in there all the way, but now it's finished, it's over. And he says, Eloi, Eloi, lama sabachthani. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? We've lost. It seems to be what's said here, what looks like a tragedy and what looks like a disaster. And we feel that in our own lives too, don't we? You know, I I didn't make those mistakes totally on purpose, but I made a lot of them on purpose. I thought it would turn out better than this. I hoped it would turn out better than this, but it didn't. And we feel this defeat and this disappointment and the discouragement and the disillusionment and our delinquency, and we feel that so deeply. And we want there to be victory. And then we get up the next day and it happens again. And we wonder, what in the world? And it it seems like what Jesus said here is finished. It's like, all right, we failed. It's done. It's over. 
I die, and he dies, and they simply wrap him up and put him in a tomb, and it's done. And that next day, the Saturday, if you will, of that particular week, there is incredible, where were they? They were scattered all over the place. They were afraid and hiding, and that's what life felt like, and it feels like that for us sometimes too, doesn't it? Certainly it does. But when he says it is finished, it is actually this. It is actually the fulfillment of a transaction of providing payment for what was rightfully belonged to him as the creator. You see, he has created you. He thought about you before time ever began. He thought about me before time ever started. And then when conception happened, he knew about every little detail. He knew how many hairs you'd have on your head at 21. He knew how many fewer you'd have at 41. He knew everything about you and every detail about you. You see, he made you and he created you and he loved what he made. And yet we walked away. You see, he wants to make a masterpiece out of our lives, even the lives of disappointment, even our lives of defeat, even our lives of disillusionment, even our lives of delinquency. And, and, and in fact, he doesn't even promise to come in and fix it all and make it all go away and have life be perfect. He doesn't make that promise. Because we know in this world there are tribulations, right? But that he, Christ has overcome those. And he wants to work in our lives. And it doesn't mean he's going to make us perfect, but he's going to set us on a new path and do a brand new thing. And here's the deal. Those are lives that are touched by his death and touched by his resurrection. And for those of you in Mrs. Loafman's class, in order that we might find the victory in Christ and the deliverance that he gives to us, that there is a newness to what he wants to do in our lives. <coughs> So let me ask you a question for this morning. I think it's the key question. Have you ever responded to God's call to let your mess become his masterpiece? Have you ever responded to that call? Do you sense God saying to you, hey, I want to come in and make a masterpiece out of the mess you've made? And we all have made a mess of it, right? Of course we have. It's the nature of sin that we destroy it destroys what should have been, what was supposed to be. And we all messed it up. Have you ever responded to that call? Maybe for some of you, you say, you know what, I have, but I need to keep responding day by day, giving my life to him. For some of you, frankly, you probably have wrestled with this, of responding to his call to let him do what he can do in you and through you. And maybe you haven't really ever decided to surrender your life to him. It's a risky deal, right? Feels risky. Man, if I'm going to give control over to someone else, what's he going to do with me? Scriptures tell us that his will is both good and acceptable and, in fact, perfect for us. doesn't mean that he makes life easy, but it does mean that he makes it real. And he puts it on a whole new path and heads us in a new direction. Have you ever responded to that call? And here's the deal. It is simply a step of faith to put our faith in the work of Christ. Because the work of Christ went from this cross where he said it is finished, it was enough that I paid everything you need to have your life change. And then he says, I would like to turn it into something of beauty, into something of incredibleness over your lifetime that you would both honor me and love me and love people deeply. Have you ever made that decision? Have you ever decided that? It seems to me that that's what was happening in the early church. In the early church, at that day of Jesus rising from the dead, wouldn't you like to have been there? I mean, it would have been a radical, amazing experience to all of a sudden have, have this announced and to have all of your, your disillusionment and your defeats and your delinquencies and the disasters of your life addressed by a risen Christ. And that's what we decide on today, right? 